I'll be timekeeping, um, and I'll just let people know that they have five minutes left, and then one minute left. And um, I hope you all enjoy the day and enjoy your time here at LIT. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also want to make a particular acknowledgement, in case I forget, because one often does, of this project that was launched by myself, Trisha Kieran, three institutions in Limerick came together to launch a project that we uh, have uh, been particularly interested in all our lives, our professional lives, and we now had the opportunity to work together on this. Uh, but also, it, a project like this can't possibly be successful without the help of others. And uh, so I don't forget, we are collaborators in this research with colleagues, Dr. Mark Cole, St. Mary's College, Dr. Adrian Hunter, at the University of Oxford, and Professor Norman Richardson from Wales University College, Queens, who I've just introduced you to. And we also had a steering committee, and looking around the room, I see Dr. Uh, Mary Masterson, for example, Dr. Brian Horton, Dr. Timothy Murphy, um, Dr. Miss, uh, Mr. Terry Toomey of LIT may be joining us later. And there's a list of people, and we thank you for all that support as well. So what I want to do is very much include you all in the acknowledgements from the outset. And I just want to set up the theme and the arrangements. So I'm just going to speak a couple more minutes about the theme of the day. And then we are going to launch this report that we have been working on. And I have to acknowledge the funders of Scotens, Ubuntu, Noisy, and an international challenge um, fund as well that have supported us as incrementally we were developing our thoughts and our ideas on this. And what we're really pleased about is to get an audience because this is a topic that I personally feel gets pushed on the margins because of every country's um, priority in certain type subjects and numeracy, literacy strategies that we've all heard of and in England, for example, for decades. And that doesn't take away from that. But actually, some of the most important um, issues that we have to face, and particularly in global times, this particular moment in our life, which politically for many of us must seem one of the most intolerant, with politicians at the highest level uh, preaching uh, intolerance, and that comes back into the classroom, primary and secondary school, and into higher education. And how do we handle that? How do we challenge that? So the, uh, and that, as Joko was pointed out, sometimes it's the elephant in the room that people can't talk about, they don't get the space to talk about. And that's one of the findings of our project, which we're going to talk about in a moment. So, as a project develops, you often refine your thinking and articulation. And if I was to sum up what I think our paper is about, and the contributors today, is it's about a promotion of social justice, but it's also challenging prejudices, question mark. And that prejudice might be within ourselves, as well as in our student cohort, our academy, and in society. And the thing is, what is the prejudice or the discomfort that we find in our research or that we're aware of that comes into perhaps our classroom? How are we tackling it or challenging it? And very importantly, are we challenging it in a way that doesn't marginalise, ridicule or exclude people further? So it, it has implications <coughs> for pedagogy, which we'll also be alluding to later. So this is consistent with the findings of uh, the work of other people uh, that are in this seminar and that is helping us together. Um, and it's filling the void, I think, um, of this area. So now I want to um, move on to just the morning's activities. You will notice that after our introductory seminar, uh, dissemination, which I think, uh, particularly in our findings, which we uh, feel in some ways uh, have been either not identified or under-recognized, uh, we start a dialogue of thought amongst yourselves. 
And you notice we have three speakers before what is um, uh, promised to be an outstanding lunch, and three speakers <laughs> after. <laughs> and so you have to stay the day just to get the lunch. I mean, I'm totally <laughs> totally fantastic. That's why we're here. <coughs> the venue and the lunch. So, what I'd like you to do, this is not a conference where you get presented at you for an hour, an hour, an hour, so you've had, it's at only 20 minutes, Anne will be very tired, and the timekeeping, time you notice she's just told me to get on with it, by her <laughs> and, um, and I want you to hold on to your questions, if, if you possibly can, for just over an hour's time, where we'll have a plenary, so you'll hear ours and the three other speakers, and then we'll have a conversation, a dialogue. And we've called the other speakers dialogue leaders rather than conference presenters because it's a dialogue that we hope we stimulate here in the breaks and the spaces between the day, which is critical, and that you take away and that you find new colleagues perhaps to network over those dialogues. Um, and so if you look at the um, scheduling, uh, we're delighted that we have a team from Galway here, Dr. Manuela Hines, Dr. Kevin Davidson, and Elaine Keane is part of that, looking at primary teacher education students' view of teacher religion in England. After that, uh, our colleague, Dr. Karen Sundberg, uh, has put together her presentation with Dr. Linda Johnson of Baladala University, Sweden, uh, she can't be here, but they're collectively giving us a perspective of the student, the system in Sweden, which they call non-confessional and non-secularist. And uh, the reason for <coughs> that, we also have Dr. Jürgen Nathan, University of Limerick, a really nice sort of coming at this, where you get that overlap between medicine and spirituality of medical students, educators' perspectives of receiving and delivering cultural identity curriculum, this time within medical education. So we chose the three very different ways in which religious education and beliefs comes into our teaching, our thoughts, our classrooms, and also in the lives of students. At a time when it's getting more difficult, perhaps, to express that or feel comfortable. So that's the program of the day. I'm now going to move on to the first talk to make sure that we are uh, scheduled on time. And this is presented by the three people in this team, Dr. Patricia Kieran from Mary I and Ryan from LIT and myself. And it's this some conference subject, this um, seminar subject that stimulated our thoughts in, in ensuring that you would be here and like, giving you the opportunity to hear it first. So just before I go further, I'll give you a lot of information. Is there anything that uh, isn't clear that I've left out anyone needs to know? Okay. I suppose we just want to acknowledge our funding bodies and also the National Forum who helped us organise this event today. So we're incredibly grateful. <coughs> so you have an executive summary of our research. Uh, welcome to everybody who's just arrived. We're delighted to see you um, in your pack. And we are going to just give you a taster of what the research has been about. Um, the research partners, I'll let my colleague Anne tell you about that. Hi. Uh, yes, our research partners uh, are the three of us here in the in Republic of Ireland. And we have Dr. Norman Richardson from Strangulus. Uh, University of Belfast. We also have Dr. Niall Cole in Belfast and Dr. Aiden Hunter in Ulster University. So the research, which is multidisciplinary and interinstitutional and international and collaborative, um, we work with six universities and we focused on third level students uh, with their views on religions and beliefs. That's the area that we uh, were interested in. And we had, um, we had two self-selecting focus groups at each institution. And um, we wanted to uh, identify key issues for, not only for our own knowledge, but for policy and professional practice for their future professional practice. 
uh, we had in total between all the institutions uh, 900 third level um, full time students that we were able to um, interview and conduct our research with. And I think one of the things that we were able to see by meeting with these students is really how their, how their courses and their education prepares them for their future professional practice in understanding religions, beliefs, and, and people from other backgrounds and cultures. Our research design that uh, we had a number of people, um, I guess, assist us on was we used the, the, the European Value Survey and the European Social Survey as our, as our question base for structuring our survey. And we had ethical clearance at all the institutions involved that we spoke of. And we asked their participation through, um, through email, but also going into the classrooms uh, with, the, with the agreement of their lecturers to encourage them to participate in the survey. And um, we, had, we also wanted to encourage them to participate because in the end, like how you have your uh, executive summary, we will too be sharing them the, the valuable information that we gave from them so that they can take that into their future professional practice as well. And so I'm just gonna start with some of the findings or the outcomes from the research. And we had, from our sample group, we had um, the majority of participants were uh, from 18 to 24 year olds and 10% uh, were um, greater than 25. We even had, I think a couple members, people were over the age of 55. And then we also asked them, we, we, we asked them what their gender was, but we asked them, it was an open question. We asked them to state what, the, what their gender was. We didn't want to, um, we didn't want to disadvantage anybody or let, uh, keep anybody out. So these are the different uh, answers that we got, the majority of which are female, and um, then we had 23% male. We had a couple of people saying, I do not identify. We had non-binary, gender fluid, and we had somebody that gave a number. Okay, when it came to uh, religion, their own religiosity or how they self-identified, these questions we took straight from the European Values Survey so we can compare and contrast our data with a much larger body of data. Um, so we asked them, do you consider yourself belonging to any particular religion or denomination? So 79% of them said, yes, I do. 16% um, of them, this is in the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, said no. And in the Republic of Ireland, the 2016 census said that 10% of people ticked the no religion box. So the student cohort, one might imagine that students, a younger age profile, you know, would show up as being a lot more non-religious. So, I mean, it's above the national average in the Republic of Ireland, but still high levels of religiosity. And interestingly, 4.5%, they don't know. So, you know, it's an area of, I suppose, fluidity and understanding. Now, when it came to, if they did identify as belonging to a religion, we asked them to name, again, you were using EVS questions, a particular religion or denomination. And here we find overwhelmingly in the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, 64, nearly 65% tick the box of Roman Catholic. And all of the categories are given to us by the European Values Survey. So nobody was Jewish, nobody uh, was from an Eastern religion. Um, very small percentages, 3.75% other Christian denominations, 6% Presbyterian. 20.5% um, skipped. And we were looking at that. A lot of the time, students were skipping. We were wondering, they didn't skip you know, things that were easy to answer, perhaps, for them. We wondered why. And maybe we'll come back to that afterwards. We also engaged in focus groups. And what the students said in focus groups were fascinating. So if we look at the 65%, perhaps, who identified as Roman Catholic, how do they understand that label? Well, they said things like, my dad's view of the Catholic religion, I don't believe in it, 
but it influences me because he's a sweet person. I have more respect for religion because I was born into it, not because I believe in it. So it's kind of cultural Catholicism, and it reminds us of Grace Daly believing, belonging without believing. So we're, we're wondering what's happening here. This is from the north of Ireland when it comes to religion. And sometimes people associate religion with, I suppose, in Ireland, on the island of Ireland, it has a history of sectarianism, intolerance, it, it's, you know, it can be very divisive. But we, we saw through the focus groups that religion is also a positive force in the lives of students. Um, but it also serves as an identifier. And one person said, I think as well probably part of the thing is that if you're a Christian, you go here. These are for teacher educators that we interviewed to a particular college. And if you're Catholic, you go there. Which I'm not saying that should be the case. It really shouldn't. But it's the way that things are. Somebody says, I feel like the troubles and stuff is what's driven us all apart. But in our generation, it doesn't seem to. So the notion of a healing here. We can have a conversation with another religion, and including Catholicism, and it not be an issue. It's just because we don't have the pain and the hurt that the other generations have. So I would say that we are kind of the peace-bridging generation, because we have the knowledge of what's happened, and it's been horrible and a tragedy. So there are these lovely moments of hope and dialogue in here. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, it's the traditions, another person says in the focus group. You know, the 12th of July, the bonfires, those kind of things that are the barriers as opposed to the beliefs. So there's an element of criticality here, of, you know, the kind of intersection between culture and religion. Where does one end? Where does the other begin? Because that's even what I've learned from being friends with a very devout Catholic in terms of morals and things like that, we agree the same. So there's this understanding and reaching out in some of the people participating in the focus groups. So back to our quantitative data, how welcoming are people in Ireland, North and South, to people of diverse religions, beliefs and to none? And we found that 17.5% thought people are extremely welcoming or very welcoming. Um, somewhat welcoming, 56.5%, and then 8.25%, very unwelcoming or extremely unwelcoming. But it doesn't really give you a picture of this great welcoming, you know, attitude here. And again, a high number of people skipped. People say things like, in focus groups, my aunt converted to Buddhism, my grandmother was crying, my aunt was not allowed to chant in front of others. Such a beautiful religion. The family were afraid. That's one of our themes, fear. Knowledge prevents fear, somebody said. It's like the media presents a distorted image of Muslims. People mix culture up with religion. And somebody else says, when people our age are looking for a boyfriend, they'd say, I'll stick with my own kind. So these were the findings that were coming out. We asked them, do you think discrimination on the basis of religion or belief is rare in Ireland, North and South? And 9% um, strongly agree or agree, whereas 15% strongly disagree. I don't think it's rare. So again, there is a sense that, and that's one of the findings of our um, research, that racism came up as a key issue in discrimination. My family are racist, someone said, but they don't mean it. They're uneducated about it. Irish people are racist and xenophobic. It's a subtle, invisible racism. They're seemingly friendly, but condescending. For example, I witnessed them asking a 25-year-old professional woman unusual questions. Are you allowed to travel on your own? They wouldn't ask that of another professional woman of majority culture or faith. This is heightened by religious difference. How are we doing time-wise? Okay. The times, somebody says, are changing, but not for all. I used to want to think there is very little racism. It's improving, but there is a good way to go. We're an island. 
There is the white Catholic stereotype. Anyone different stands out. Not a lot of people with any disability in the teaching profession because of health and safety issues, we're told. So we're widening up you know, to who's, who's putting themselves forward for teaching or who's being invited to participate in the teaching profession. Whose profession uh, does it seem to belong to? Kids see people with physical disability and think they can't teach. Being a teacher means you're an image of what is accepted in society. So we asked them about their third level course that they're doing. And our cohort were um, initial teacher education students and social science students. And we asked them, has your course informed your understanding of the potential relevance of religions and beliefs for your future professional practice? And 3% here said, not at all, you know. <clears throat> or sorry, 3% said it has extremely, sorry. And here, 10.5% said uh, not at all. So there's a long way to go here. We need to, you know, to, to move this up. A lot of them thinking, you know, that their course hasn't really impacted. Um, so they say things like the majority of students in third level are comfortable with difference. They're definitely educated, and we have to be respectful and accepting but I don't know how much they know. So I think this is just how much do they know. And their courses, are their courses supporting them in, in knowing? My institution is open-minded, but there's such pressure for maths and science. Education about religious and belief diversity slips away and is a lower priority. And they say, for teachers who are aware of it, Diversity of religions and beliefs is always on our mind, no matter what they're teaching in the curriculum. But I'd say most are not conscious of it. Okay, so how relevant then, we ask them, do you think an awareness of different religious traditions and philosophical worldviews is to your future professional practice? So they can see it's extremely relevant, you know, or very, very relevant. Only 4% here say that it is extremely irrelevant or not relevant. So they're aware that it's really, really relevant. But on the other hand, they don't feel their courses have been Can I really, Trish, yeah. as well? So, yeah, so the, it's very relevant for all of uh, uh, the primary school teachers and also for the social care workers. And what I found with a couple of the, the focus groups as well, that although in the last slide they they might not feel like their course um, educates them on all the different areas of different religions and beliefs. They did, however, find in some of their courses um, that they are learning the skills to either be more open or to uh, encourage the students to inform themselves upon meeting somebody that maybe come from a different background. So. Uh, in some ways, they're they're educating themselves, and so they're learning a, a transferable skill and to help support their professional practice. So, so um, they said things like, um, "These were initial teacher education students. There was a Sikh child in school, a boy, and because of his uncut hair, he was mistaken for a female by other kids." If kids know about religious diversity, they can be more respectful. This kid was wearing a bracelet. I didn't want to prod the kid with millions of questions. These are wonderful people, so interesting. We need to know much more. So this was a student teacher who really didn't know anything much about the Sikh religious tradition or the symbols of Sikhism, but felt, you know, I didn't want to prod the kid. Um, they, they just said, you know, that their lack of knowledge was problematic for them. Increased religious diversity in Ireland is a potential security threat. We put this in because of the securitization of religion and education about religion, particularly the prevent strategy in the UK. And we asked them, you know, what they thought about it. And here we could have a spread. 19.5% skipped this, but 
13.5% agreed that increased religious diversity is a potential security threat. 30% were neutral, 24 disagreed, and 11.5% strongly disagreed. But this is, when you add the agree to the neutral and the strongly agree, so you get 45%, and you know, that's, that's an issue. Um, the research we feel is appropriate at a time of growing intolerance and crime speech, as Marie alluded to, in a society that is becoming increasingly polarized, which challenges the ideology of interculturalism. And we feel there are implications for how we respond to difference in terms of policy impact and professional practices. Do you want to talk yes. about it? And I'm just coming to the end of the presentation, and if I had to draw out two of the findings, which uh, we were not, I personally was not expecting at the beginning, so for me that's a feeling that we have unearthed something, are these two issues. And we mentioned, I mentioned earlier the elephant in the room. The uh, questions led in our analysis to fear. Fear, uh, you've got some very, um, um, close quotes there. If we take the first one um, about the wearing of uh, henna, where a, 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 a young woman of Muslim background felt uncomfortable to be manifesting her faith. And we've seen similar uh, research in my own and others about uh, women and girls and teachers of uh, Islamic backgrounds wearing the hijab. Um, I'm particularly interested in the one there is aggression when someone has no faith, aggression around people. So in that one, you've got people who can be aggressive towards the other, who expresses a different faith, or people who are not part of your own. Uh, the third quote um, is about the existential question, does God exist? And I love this idea uh, of students saying we need to bring philosophy back into the classroom because I couldn't agree more at all levels because it's a wonderful starting point about all of the underpinning ideas. Um, the last um, three are really important. So we've talked about fear, now bias. And by bias, it means yours and mine. And this is where I found it was particularly interesting because if we look at this, this is a student saying, they don't feel they can speak in the classroom. If you have a look, I'd be afraid to open my mouth in college. We know some atheists in our year who say, who cannot say what they want to. Uh, One-sided readings and in the library when we analyze the research. Isn't that interesting that the resources, not just our views or uh, the assumption of what our views are, um, and no room for opposition. As I said earlier, where is the space for a student to have an alternative voice? And how do you manage that in such a way that at the end of that session, that student is not marginalized, excluded, ridiculed, in a disadvantaged position because you encourage them to have a voice, they say we don't give people. So it's about a pedagogy that we use and lecturers' own beliefs. So the last three, so the first half, key finding, it was fear. Fear of people not of one's religion who not wanting to accept one's own. And the security threat question, part of that elephant in the room. The last one that I want you to take from this is the bias. So when I said I started this off, this is tackling prejudices, question mark. Are we tackling our own? And I've given presentations with my colleagues here to ESA, et cetera, and I feel that in terms of my own positionality, I felt very uncomfortable because if, like many of you in this room, we have grown up professionally with anti-racist, uh, equal opportunity uh, policies, the work of Kinchlow, Steinberg, Troyner, the work we believe in, we want to believe in, that is, and that, if that's my bias, actually I'm pleased about it, because yeah, I, I know that's my bias. And I think through teaching council values, and the DES in England, and in Sweden, it's very strong on cultural values, we embrace them and, and promote those for all would-be teachers. One wasn't expecting people to say, 
I not, don't share those biases, but I have to because I need to get agreed from you. I have to because you have the power, thinking of Foucault, and I have to because I might be ostracized, but you're not speaking for me when you speak in the class. So those are the two key points, fear and bias, that we found coming out of our research that we particularly wanted to probe. So I've stopped there. Uh, because we have three more speakers. So what I'd like you to do is jot down any questions you have about that. But um, I'm going to interview, invite the next speaker to speak for 20 minutes. And this time, as I said, Dr. Yoga Nathan is going to talk from the perspective of teaching medical students. Our project was with regard to the next generation of teachers, education students, and some social science students. And if you put this question forward to um, anybody else, any other group, you may or may not have got some of the findings. But um, I'm just intrigued by this, but the fact you're so far <laughs> makes me feel <laughs> this is our time today. So, uh, a fascinating beginning. Um, if you could just get them to see Dr. Nathan. Thank you, Thank you so much.
they follow mosque, they go to church, they follow uh, Jewish uh, tradition. See, I was born in Malaysia, and I never realized or had any discussion like you all are having in the West. <coughs> because in Malaysia, there's Hindus, there's Muslims, there's Catholics, there's the, all, all religion. And we all grew up together, we were all neighbors, we were all friends. If there was a Hindu festival, all my Chinese and uh, Muslim friends would all would come. And if there's a Muslim festival, we all would go to their house. And so there was no difference. Really. But when I came here to UK first, and uh, the, there's some, every country has a problem, but it's not as so widespread as what is in the West. I suppose, in a way, maybe the West feels they're being invaded by other religion, but I suppose the West were the first crusaders who invaded the East, so we did that for another day. Now we have a whole lot of customs, I'm not going to go through every one of them, okay? And when you have time, have, have a look at that. Then there was one about, because it was a medical school, and it's about that that time. Now Hindus have different beliefs, and you all, have, and Catholics, you all have a big. In a Hindu, if you, are, if you die, you must bury within 24 hours. You cannot wait longer than that. But here you have post-mortem and you have all sorts of things. And Hindu always likes to die in the house. But in the West, I don't know why, the doctors always like to keep you in the hospital. They won't let you to go home, even though they know you're going to die. And then they'll try to give you all sorts of medication and everything to keep you living for a week when your quality of life for that week is worse than if you were dead. So that's a lot of education that I hope our younger doctors will learn. There's one lecture on death and dying. We all should learn to embrace death and enjoy the work. It is something the person has already, I think sometimes life on earth is suffering. And he has done it. Let him go. But remember the good things of whatever poor the person is and was dying. So in death and dying, there's, there's quite a lot of things. And the uh, HSC produced this relevance of faith and spirituality in healthcare. It's about 146 pages, so I take a while to read through them. And then, like you said, we would like to die at home and we'd like to have our own family around us and we like to be with them and chant some prayers. And, and there's a. Now, in a Hindu that in the house, you have to wash them and all that. And then, <coughs> We all cremate, we don't bury. Okay, so I hope somebody will cremate me and not bury me when I die to be buried. Now the thing is, in the house all the male, female, all of the women do it. But then from the house when the body goes to the crematorium, only the males go with it. The females don't go. When well, females sort of get the house washed and trained and everything. And then for a month, there is <coughs> sort of prayer every night. And for a month, they will not cook anything in the house. All the photos will be turned around. They will not go to the temple. They will not go for any function and occasion. And then at the end of that month, then the ashes that are brought from the crematorium, they take it to a river or a sea and put it, and there's a lot of prayers there. So there's a lot of things that they, they would like to do. And I did something on migrants and help. See, I'm a migrant. Anybody who comes in, but when you say migrant, everybody thinks, oh, it's a refugee or a asylum seeker. No, no, there's so many other migrants, economic migrants. There. So, uh, my wife is Irish. My children are all baptized. I'm still a little. I go to church sometimes with them. I have no issues. And so, it's how each of us, in whatever religion or whatever us belief we have, is willing to accept everybody else, an individual. Because in the end, see, there's a lot of ways in which human rights and health can be impacted. And, and when a migrant comes, we always forget, we just think of the time that they arrive. But then, that pre departure, there's a whole lot of problems they might be having. Then, during the traveling, they might have a whole lot of problems. Then, in the host community, and sometimes they are sent back. So, there's a lot of issues that need to be addressed in their. I'm there. And people are moving from all over the world to every other part of the world. And you can't stop migration. 
But you know what's happening in the Mexican border and everywhere else. But this is my belief because I was a GP for a long, long, long time. Then I went to Lebanon to work with the refugees for five years. I thought I was doing a wonderful job. I had a clinic. Patients came to me. I saw them individually, one for one. They were all very happy with me. I, last two years of my five years, I got a house within the camp and stayed with them. Because if you don't stay with them, you really don't understand how they are living. And I learned a lot from them. Then when I came back to UK, which is UK based <coughs> charity, Mercury for Palestinians, I did a master's in public health. And my thesis was on health needs of Palestinian refugees living in Lebanon. So when I went back and I did focus groups and questionnaires and everything, <coughs> they gave the top 10 needs and it was like a, <coughs> the focus group was, they all, I, each one identified their own and then no discussion, no talking, no influencing each other. They just wrote in the paper whatever they wanted. And then it was collected and we wrote. They gave me 10. The first five of the needs that they wanted, I didn't do anything in my five years. They wanted freedom. They wanted justice and they wanted to go back home. Then they wanted good sanitation and environment. They wanted good drinking water. We had only electricity for six hours a day. It's still going on in Lebanon. There's still only in the south. There's only electricity for six hours a day. So when I first came to the UK, I was asking, does the lift work? Because I, I didn't realize it still works. And the sixth or seventh came healthcare, the medical, the real medical medical. So this is the what I believe in. There's determinants. Of so all these things affect your health in some form or other, and they call it social determinants of health. But then as a GP, you sit there and see a patient in front of you for five minutes and you talk to them. But then when they go home, let's say, very rarely, but once a month he comes, how many hours is he going to spend by himself? And if you don't understand what are the effects or the circumstances that he's going to be living in, he or she is going to be living in, what type of lifestyle, life circumstances, and what other worries and problems, and then we give them a hold of to do this or do this or do that. And in the medical, you see, like yesterday there was a lecture, we all talk in silos. There's a whole group of health promotion people talking about don't smoke. Then there's another people talking don't drink. Then there's another people talking eat a good diet. Then there's another group taking do good exercise. Very rarely people talk about mental health and stress and all that. See, in all of us, if we don't have a coping mechanism, that's why the deprived people are becoming more and more sick because all the affluent people and all of you living, stand, sitting here, I hope, all of you have stress. But all your stress is acute. Your adrenaline keeps pumping and you're all excited and you want to do something and then you come down, you cope, you, you're able to get out of it. But then if you're in a deprived situation, you get the stress and it goes on and on and on and on and on. How do you get out of it? So we try to do so many things in Glasgow when I was working there. They built a whole city like it, houses and everything. And took the people and put them there. And then said, okay, go to house now, stay. How were they going to stay there? I, I better go a little bit fast. So this is a little bit about the refugees. And we all, when we think of refugees, we all think, oh, all the people from the east are coming to the west. Not even one to two percent of the refugees from the east are coming to the west. Do you think anybody believes that they are refugees from Ireland? No? Yes, they are. These are just some figures of refugees from which country they are coming. A lot from Asia, 16 million. And then 5 million. But if you see the next one, 16 million are refugees from Asia, but then 17 million I looked after the Asia, Asian countries. In Europe, we have 700,000 700, 
refugees from Europe, from the different states, and you look after two million. But then there's a whole big drama and story behind looking after the refugees and oh, they're all coming here, they're scroungers and they're this and that. Sorry if I'm a little bit emotional. You have refugees from Ireland going to all these countries. This is just to sort of, and those in asterisks are numbers because they don't want to talk about it because it's too political. The Palestinian refugees are refugees for more than 60 years. Can you imagine for your whole life time being a refugee? And do Pakta by Unarwa, where you're only allowed to study up to secondary level if possible. Now, they want to go home, kind of, but see, it is a very, I don't know, it's very difficult situation. And the thing is, <coughs> can you keep something going in the media for 60 years? No. But something other is happening, something <coughs> other is happening. One of the things that, when I state that they wanted solidarity, they just wanted us to go and talk about them to the rest of the world, to let them know that there are people there whose grandchildren, great grandchildren are all born as refugees. And they will not die as refugees because this is not the end. <coughs> now, this was a study that we did. Now, it is called C2M, I mean, cultural competence medical educators. Partners strongly believe that training and evaluation of medical teachers is a fundamental but neglected aspect of ensuring cultural competence in healthcare. The CPM project aims to contribute to building and expanding cultural competence teaching capacity. It's quite a few years since we did it. See, we all do a whole lot of this research, and we still go on doing and doing. Yesterday I was listening to a talk of an inaugural talk of the professor in UL. All that he talked was what I was doing in Glasgow 15 years ago. And they're still talking. Nothing has changed. The deprived are deprived and the affluent are affluent. And there has to be a problem, so maybe somebody is keeping the problem going. So from this we sort of published a few papers. <coughs> I just need one particular last one. And it's Students also did one so that their views can be known also. And they said the weak association between overall self perceived cultural competence and assessed knowledge, reflecting ability and consultation behavior, support the hypothesis that measures of self perceived competence. Lot of think, oh, we are, we are okay. But that's not true. We always don't put our true self in front of it. We always have a and what we found was, this study showed that medical teachers have moderate preparedness, that is differential across topics. Besides the high interest in receiving training that was reported, especially on communication related topics, emphasized the importance of incorporating cultural issues into the medical curriculum which is a big problem because the medical problem, curriculum is so crammed up. You want to include public health into the medical curriculum, curriculum I have such, such a big problem. So, see, now primary care is supposed to be the best, but then secondary care takes over everything. Everybody is happy when they have a bypass. But they are not happy to do an exercise or to eat healthy diet and drink alcohol. As a quiet. So what do you think is the most important factor? And why do you think I showed you this picture? This is such a beautiful picture, right? We all want to live in this beautiful world. <coughs> but then we are in an upside down world. That's why I put the title as upside down. So what is the most important? Anybody? Anybody? You all are Done so much of tell me what do you find is stopping you all from doing what you want to do? Oh, why are you all silent? Fear, probably. Fear. 
Okay, fear, yes. Why fear? Well, it's good to be part of the group. And, oh. uh, at the same time, you want to do... But, but who can to... correct this? You want to do something, who can do it? Only you. Hmm? Only the who? Only the person themselves, I think, is it? Okay, person himself. Anybody else who can do really a change that will make whatever you want come true? You forget the most important person. You need the politicians. You need them to make the laws and the policies. If there are no laws, if there are no policies, nothing you do and nothing you want to do will happen. And the money is all with them. And the other thing is knowledge. See, the media and the social media now, I don't know how many of you saw the viral of a boy in Huddersfield, a British boy who kicked and poured water on a Syrian boy who had his hand fractures. It went viral <coughs> all over. Now the police are taking a case. It's happening every day, everywhere. And my, the social media gets it. But then knowledge, there are two types of knowledge. Knowledge that the media wants you to know. But then is it the truth? We all talk about evidence-based and evidence-based. But you know statistics, numbers can be changed to say whatever you want to say. So how do you know whatever you are talking is the truth? Okay, can I yes. pause? Because that is a wonderful point to me. How do we know knowledge we're saying is true? Which relates back very well to our own, because our students, the cohort, are saying that we don't necessarily have the truth. From their sense, we have bias. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Milton. Uh, as we just uh, as we just invite um, Manuela and her team to come forward for the hallway, if I can sort of just provide a little overview of the points that seem to come across and again that resonates with our own work, is that Nathan's talk was about cultural competence. Um, and whether we have moderate preparedness for medical students in the future as doctors. And we were finding, our concerns with statistics, what level of preparedness do we have after all the teaching and educational opportunity we give teachers. And um, fear again came up, and the issue of what sort of knowledge and whose knowledge. So, Moving swiftly on, my uh, colleagues here from Galway, I'd like to hand over to yourself, Kevin Davidson, Manuela Hines. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, so just, just before my uh, 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 part about the context of, uh, of education in Ireland, I might just add a quick little preamble, which is that when uh, Manuela and Elaine and I presented this uh, paper um, I, uh, at a European conference recently on uh, some of our preliminary data, we presented it to a room of everyone who was not from Ireland. And they were quite surprised at the context that I'm about to tell you, whereas I think people from Ireland just sort of take it for granted and think of that's just the way it is, and yes, it's a bit odd, but we don't really actually think too deeply about it, whereas when we presented it to an audience that was solely from outside Ireland, they really reminded us that this is a little bit different from other places. So let me just start off in relation to the context. So following hundreds of years of repression of Catholicism, uh, after independence in 1922, um, religion became central to education in Ireland. And, it, um, and, and actually by design, it wasn't always uh, that way. Um, uh, the late John Coulihan, uh, in some of his research with other colleagues, had pointed out that by design, um, it wasn't supposed to be uh, uh, that way. However, be, uh, religion became central to, uh, to education in Ireland, public education in Ireland. The vast majority, over 96% of public schools here in Ireland are owned and operated by religious orders. Uh, mandatory religious instruction at all grade levels and guided by explicit Catholic ethos uh, that permeate the discourse of educational instruction in Ireland. The Bunrak Naharan, uh, the Constitution of Ireland, while protecting religious uh, equality broadly, uh, doesn't guarantee a religiously neutral education to children. The vast majority of primary teacher education programs in Ireland is denominational. Teachers um, are contractually required to teach 
religious education. We have a funny thing in Ireland called Section 37.1 of the Equality Act, which allows people to discriminate against others if they can prove that, uh, that they are a threat to the religious order of, say, schools or hospitals. Many schools and hospitals, again, are, uh, um, uh, have patrons, religious patrons, and so if it can be proven that um, someone is threatening the religious order, um, they can be discriminated against, and that is embedded in the Equality Act in Ireland. Um, school admissions policies until very, very recently, only a few weeks ago, um, used to explicitly favor Catholic students by requiring a baptismal certificate. Uh, accommodating or exempting non, uh, uh, sorry, enrolled non-Catholic students is not easy when religion permeates our school culture. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with Irish schools, most Irish schools are named after saints or patrons, religious patrons, and so on. When you enter the school, there are often statues of saints and so on, or possibly the Virgin Mary, um, that uh, uh, notice boards and so on are often very much full of the, the, uh, the, the ethos, of the Catholic ethos of the school. And I'll have an example of that in a moment. Um, so therefore, it's impossible to ensure that religious freedom of minorities uh, uh, can be protected within Irish schools. Privileging uh, the religious ethos overrides the right of teachers to contribute equally to their profession. So uh, again, I won't read this all out to you, but I know I, I appreciate the people at the back probably can't read this. Again, this is an example of a notice board in the Irish primary school and the new Catholic uh, uh, religious uh, uh, education curriculum from 2015. Uh, so again, I won't read all this to you, but as you can say, uh, uh, at the bottom it says, the Catholic school provides religious education for pupils in accordance with doctrines, practices, and traditions of the Roman Catholic Church, and promote, uh, promotes the formation of pupils in the Catholic faith. So, despite all of this, Ireland is changing, and there, it's becoming much more religiously diverse, and the, the Central Statistics Office has uh, has illustrated that there are more and more people who are identifying as non-religious or having no faith, um, and of course there are uh, people uh, with non-Catholic faith that are joining in, uh, that, that, that um, have come to Ireland as well. There was a forum on patronage and pluralism in primary schools in 2012, uh, and it offered a, a vast array of recommendations as to how to think, that, uh, think this differently. Um, one of the things that um, uh, resulted, uh, not all of them were taken up, but one of the things that was taken up was that there's a new, broader religious studies curriculum rather than faith, uh, faith formation. It was more about teaching religion to students, a, a variety of different religious perspectives to students, and so that's come on board. Most EU countries have secular education systems as opposed to uh, 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 within Ireland, um, and also in contrast, uh, in the US, the way they think about religion and education is that teachers are forbidden to promote uh, their religion or a specific religion, and yet they also have to respect the religion of those students in their classes as well. But this creates kind of an interesting kind of tension. There has been some research recently about the need to consider the religious beliefs of teachers um, uh, because they might actually have something uh, to, that, that would strengthen their pedagogical practice and their professional, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and their professional judgment and so on. But as a result of this, the, the way this is done in the United States, when they teach teachers in the United States, whenever they talk about teacher identity or they talk about um, their, their, their educational autobiography, we often, that they often mute religion um, because of the way it's set up in relation to education. And also when we talk about issues of, of multiculturalism in, in American schools, they often will uh, sort of mute or, uh, or not talk about the issue of religion because of the way it's situated uh, in, in the education system. So, all of this context then brings us to where we're at in relation to the research project that we've conducted um, about how we might consider um, how uh, the, the, the predominance of religion in Irish education as it relates to diversifying education. So when we're thinking of diversifying uh, education and teacher education specifically, what do we need to think about in relation to the issues and the context um, of religion in Irish schools? I can pass it on to my colleague. Okay, so we'll be looking at, and it links very much with your project and some of the quotes and the observations that you made earlier, is there certain people that uh, choose the route into teaching in Ireland, given this particular context of um, the great majority, particularly of primary schools, being denominational and Catholic. Um, the wider diversity um, in initial teacher education study, diet study, 
we look at all, all sorts of um, socio-demographic background variables, but for this presentation we're focusing specifically on, on religion. So we've collected um, a lot of data and we'll be looking now at the undergraduate primary cohort and the sample that we're using is a national sample of um, applicants to initial teacher education programs um, for primary teachers across Ireland in state-funded um, institutions. So we looked at religious affiliations of those people that applied to become primary teachers. We looked at their uh, religiosity as well, their religious practice, and then we looked at their beliefs or their attitudes towards teaching religion. Um, so I'll start just with the, um, uh, with the religious affiliations. Um, and looking at, here you have undergraduate um, primary, undergraduate post-primary, here we actually have a comparison. So as I said, we, we look at um, teacher education entrance across the spectrum. We also indeed look at post-primary entrance. So this is just for the purpose of the comparison. We have 90.4% of those who enter or who apply for undergraduate primary initial teacher education um, programs are Catholic, compared to 86% of those who go into undergraduate post-primary preparation programs and 85. So really we have a significantly, though not hugely, but significantly higher percentage of those going, choosing the primary path Catholic compared to those going into post-primary education, which again would make sense with this thesis that in post-primary you choose a specific subject, you might be teaching science or English or whatever, while primary teachers really are required to teach religion and in most schools um, affiliate with the Catholic Church. Um, looking across, there isn't, I mean, given these um, very large percentages, there isn't really much else there, particularly when we're looking at, we also have a comparison here between applicants, entrants, and non-entrants, okay? So if we're looking at the entrants, really Church of um, Ireland, this corresponds very closely with our statistics um, for our national sample from the census, but really that we haven't much else in this sample at all, um, if you look across. And 4.8% uh, of primary entrants compared to 9.4% of post-primary um, and 97 for the postgraduate programs um, stated that they had no religion. So again, there's a quite considerable difference there. Just in comparison to our um, most recent census data, again, we see that those coming from a Catholic background are significantly overrepresented in all our initial teacher education programs, but most um, strikingly so in the undergraduate primary cohort. Religious attendance, then we wanted to see well how in, in how far do um, our applicants uh, attend religious services. And there you see from, again, we are also borrowing from the European Values Survey, we see their attendance statistics, which I have um, um, summarized now here. You see those that really regularly attend uh, religious services, it's about half, for our primary entrance, it's less than that for 40% for our undergraduate post-primary entrance and only 17% for our postgraduate post-primary entrance. <coughs> we asked them how often, how often they practice um, their religion outside of religious services and there we see 24% of our undergraduate primary entrance said that they never practice their religion outside. So again, and this is even higher for our undergraduate post-primary cohorts. So even though we might have very high, um, affiliate, high percentages of affiliation with the Catholic Church, when we look at look a little bit deeper at their practices, it, uh, it becomes clear that really they're not as close to their faith maybe as it would have been in the past or indeed for older generations. We also ask them do they consider themselves to be a religious person? So there you see very interesting. Um, 60% of the, those people that, that want to go to primary teaching, only 60% of them consider themselves a religious person. Okay? And again, it's all for the post-primary cohort. We then went towards looking at the attitudes, and that's where we also found a, an interesting non-response um, rate. It's not included here, but only about 24% of our respondents skipped these questions when we're asking them about their attitudes towards teaching religion in schools. So as a primary teacher in Ireland, I feel it is important to pass on Catholic values and beliefs to children in my care. This was a seven-point Likert scale, 
and you see that the Roman Catholic here we have divided it into different where we have very low representation from other religions. So we just um, summarized, we looked at Catholic, um, other religions and no religion. And here you see that the Catholic um, respondents are just on the midpoint, really saying, I am neither agree or disagree, while the others are significantly lower. So they show but very modest disagreement, not that they completely disagree either. They're all kind of clustered in the middle. Primary teachers should teach children about different faiths or world religions. We have much higher scores here for everybody. Okay, so very close to the top of the range, really showing that these people that want to go into primary teaching, they want to give a very balanced um, religious education to the children in their care. I think that my beliefs about religion, either as believer or non-believer, will have an influence on my approach to teaching. Interesting enough, again, this is below the midpoint scale. So there's moderate disagreement. And again, maybe that relates also to a lack of awareness and lack of our cultural or religious competence we talked about earlier. Okay, so then we looked at, and I'm sure you're um, familiar with this, these are the faith formations, level one of the faith formation goals. Um, from the Catholic preschool and primary religious education. And after what we've just seen in terms of people that these um, entrants to primary teaching considering themselves religious persons or not, when you then read through these faith formation goals that will become part of their job, it raises a lot of interesting questions. We then also had an open-ended question where we asked um, our respondents to tell us how they felt about teaching religion as part of their teaching role. And these are some of the responses. It was very, very interesting. I think religion is a cultural aspect of life all children should be aware of. I do not mind teaching children from the perspective of the Catholic Church, the religion I was baptized into. However, having the choice, I would prefer to teach from a neutral position. Okay. There's a lot more quotes here, and you can find um, more quotes in, in our... How much time have I left? Mm -hmm. Six minutes. Six minutes. Okay, yeah. not too bad. Um, I have no problem teaching according to the school's religious ethos. I will keep my own views private. Okay? Very, very interesting, this data. Even though I'm not very religious, I feel that religion is important in primary school and religion is part of our identity and provides you with the morals you need growing up. Very interesting link, I think, with your quote around the cultural um, Catholic and being brought up in the religious and really recognizing the value of it while maybe not believe in it. <coughs> so we analyzed all this data then. Again, we had a skipping um, rate here of 20, 25% nearly. And we um, categorized. So we came out with these um, categories. There was about 35% of those open-ended responses, responses um, indicated agreement, okay? Agreeing with teaching religion as part of their teaching role. And some of the responses would sound like Ireland is a religious, um, Christian country and I think religion should be part of education. So these were strong agreements. It's important for the morals of students. I will take my role seriously and encourage religious belief. Okay, 35%. Then we found our, I guess, surprising category. The, as um, Marie said earlier, this is something maybe we didn't expect as such, was 24%. Their responses really indicated that they were complying with rather than agreeing or disagreeing. So some of these answers would um, refer to, well, if it's part of the job, it's fine, I will do it. Um, it's part of the curriculum. If I have to do it, I don't mind. Or it's grand, I have no problem with it. These kind of responses. So we categorize them into these are compliant attitudes rather than agreement or disagreement. Then there was another about 19% who wanted to really clearly, either purposefully, or I don't know, they weren't really saying they were agreeing or disagreeing, they were saying they wanted to teach children about all world religions. So really this strong, um, this strong wish to educate their children for tolerance and so on, which is very encouraging for the space that we're in. Um, some responses from that. <coughs> I believe it is important as although my beliefs on religion are at a standstill, people should still all know about their religion and religions from all around the world. Okay? It is important knowledge for students to obtain, especially to learn about different beliefs and prevent racism based on religious values. 
a very strong uh, views here. Then we had about 10% had very mixed feelings. Okay, they were showing agreement, but they also highlighted uh, a lot of problems that they saw, particularly with teaching only in the Catholic faith. Um, we had 9% who showed, showed only disagreement, and then just about 3% showed that you know they were indifferent or they didn't mind. Um, they didn't really have an opinion at all. So these were our core findings in relation to their attitudes towards teaching religion, and I think they raised a lot of um, uh, it's a lot of food for thought and discussion. These are some of I give back over to sure. Kevin some of the questions that we think um, our findings are raising. Yes. So, so just to conclude, we just throw out a few questions there that, 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 that we think arise from our findings. So all primary teachers in 96% of schools. Um, are religion teachers and are guides in faith development. Is that the way it should be? Is this realistic? Is it fair or equitable? Should, uh, is it possible that we might uh, instead have specialist teachers um, or, or some uh, outside school uh, influence might be more realistic in relation to that? How may tensions between teachers' personal beliefs and responsibility for religious, mostly Catholic, education and faith development uh, impact on their professional practice, their relationships between students and teachers, or, uh, on teachers' identity and well-being. Uh, how may teachers' lack of religiosity impact on their teaching of religion or their approach to guiding faith development? And is the teaching of morality and ethics through Catholic religion by teachers who don't practice or believe in Catholicism in school with diverse student populations moral or ethical, or is it fair? Or does it offer the best opportunity to instill values and morals in Irish schools? So finally here, uh, uh, um, again, I won't read the thing because, because we're, sh we're short on time here, but it's just really interesting. This is something that, that came from the Irish Times uh, in November uh, 2015, um, and it had some views of teachers um, and sometimes former teachers who were talking about the difficulty uh, that, that we're raising in some of, that some of our data suggests about what it means to be a teacher when you're faking it, when you're going through the motions, when you're you're happy to do it, but not you know your heart isn't in, in, in it, or you know you don't completely believe in it. So it was just really nice to see some other perspectives of teachers who've gone through these uh, 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 this very similar situation. So I think for the, the, the shortness of time, I might just advance the slide. Unfortunately, I know there's a lot to read there. Okay, willing to fake it. Many entering teaching without a commit, uh, commitment to Catholicism are doing so because they are committed to teaching and are willing to fake their role as religious educators. So how many may feel uh, uh, feel that they're a fraud uh, that, and how that might impact on teachers' practice, conscience, or morality? Um, regardless of the commitment and teaching ability, faking it may not be an option to those who have very strong uh, beliefs in another faith. It might be all right for someone who doesn't have a faith to fake it. However, for those who, who are in another religion, it actually may be, number one, difficult, possibly impossible, possibly even dangerous if they were to be teaching another faith. <coughs> Um, as a part of their teaching. So in this presentation, the focus was on teachers and Irish primary schools, but it's really important to think about the question of fairness and impact of school governance system on pupils from minority religious backgrounds that haven't been addressed in this research as well. And I think that's it, other than possibly some questions, but I know we're gonna hold the questions for later. Thank you. Thank you. for keeping for that 20 minute slot. Uh, while we just set up, um, what um, comes across from this is building up uh, on Dr. Nathan's point about knowledge. On the one hand, this is with traditional Catholic patronage of schools and particularly at private level. But as Lord Deering said in a report in 2001 in, in England, how well are we preparing teachers to teach when we have children of all faiths and none, or all religions and none, and then if we build on this word, concept of knowledge, who knows anything of those other religions, or what is secularism or humanism, and those labels which we might also try and place on them. And the point about tolerance, and obviously if you get one piece of research that we're disseminating again today, and we get another piece which, in, which is coming with similar uh, results that helps enormously in thinking about issues of validity. And uh, we were saying in our presentation about the bias, our bias, the students saying what they think we want to hear because of assessment, 
And then with Dr. Uh, Davidson and Heinz saying very clearly, there's a level of compliance, again, because of, of that expectation. So issues of the overall issues of morality, ethos, ethics, where is there space for that to, to build on a broader definition of beliefs and religions? So now we move around the world, across Europe, to Sweden. And uh, it's my privilege to be a visiting professor at Maladala University in Sweden. I was there um, for a couple of weeks um, this uh, month, and uh, I've met twice now uh, my colleague here, Dr. Karen Sandberg. And she's with us for a few days to uh, collect data on uh, religions and beliefs and teacher edu religious education teaching uh, here in Ireland. And of course, we couldn't let this pass without asking uh, Dr. Sambo to tell us something of the Swedish model. So she's very kindly prepared a presentation here today in terms of uh, the Swedish uh, provision of education, which we loosely, when we were talking about it, called um, non-confessional, non but also non-secularist. So, uh, welcome, thank and you. over to you. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I will start with a bit of a context, uh, and I know I have an accent, so if I'm not making myself clear, please just ask me what I just tried to say. Um, you start school in Sweden when you are six, and then it's just been lowered from seven. So uh, when you're six, that is year zero, then you have one. Uh, so religion, history, social sciences, and geography is read as one subject after year four, and then they are individual subjects. Uh, up to year nine, and then you, when you go to upper secondary, uh, you only have like one semester of religion that is compulsory, and then you can choose to have another semester of religion. So, uh, in terms of, I heard yesterday that you have two and a half hours a week, uh, that is what you would have for all these four subjects up to year four in Sweden. So, they are read as one subject up to year four. Uh, so, well, we, I am talking about religious education, and now we are concentrating more on year four to year nine uh, in what we are talking about now. Um, so, before school, in the old days, since I'm an historian, uh, <laughs> uh, after the Reformation, uh, they were uh, by law in the 18th century that the parents were supposed to. Uh, um, make to teach the child to, to read and write, and at least once a year the priest came for a home visiting to see if they actually were scholars enough. And then they kept these church books uh, of an individual. You can see every year that they came. They how many people were in the household? If they were knows about uh, the religion, if they could read, if they could read. not write but read. Uh, people who could write, they could read. Uh, and so that was once a year. And this particular is by a man who was named Anders Jönsson, who lived in the 17th century in Vermont, small, small uh, forest part of Sweden. Uh, so that was before schooling. And uh, then came the public schools uh, in 1842. And the first wave of the religious education were the, the monotone way, uh, the objective way. And Certainly, we're going to go into these three time periods now. Uh, first, uh, Christianity only. And uh, wanted to bring up the child to be a Christian, to be faithful, and with the child was a Lutheran. Um, and there was religious faith, and they were much uh, talk and response. They showed them were to learn by heart the responses. So, why did the girls break up? Because, because, because there was a talking response. And it was obedient, the subjective child that were the goal of this education. And there were none, of course, they were not supposed to question, they were not supposed to, in any way, to question it. And it was not only just uh, faith, it was also, this is uh, school. Um, Used, this would be used in school <coughs> as geography of that is Swedish for the Holy Land. So they would know geography of the Holy Land, but they would also know uh, 
stories and so. So it's not just uh, religion, also re geography is built into this. And here you have uh, three wise men, you have And the child will say, point out, where is this, where is this, where is this? Uh, the objective way, then. And then we are moving on. Moving on. Um, a more objective, realistic understanding for religion. And now we are moving from faith to beliefs. Uh, and more also, the existential, why do are we here? Uh, what is the purpose of life? Uh, so more non-religious term. Um, <coughs> and Christianity is still the core, but other religions are studied, other religions are invited, and uh, the priority is, uh, of course, but the Christian ethics is still the core value that are supposed to be. And uh, this painting is called, Are You Profitable, Dear? And it's maybe the, how are you existing in the society? And you know, the learning fabric. Uh, it's a bit of the answer, I have one shot, just looking at the window. Um, then, in 94, uh, there were a new curriculum. And now, they were <coughs> in the conception of life. And now they were. No, they were really, really based on it was going to be non-confessional. You were not, if you were a Christian teacher, you were not supposed to tell the students that you were. Uh, so we're going to be non-confessional in all aspects of the school. Uh, you, wouldn't, you could not have, for example, mass. You couldn't go to the Christian mass in school. Uh, you should, could not have school prayers. You could not have any of these. Um, and the existential, existential was still, it was still how do I have a good friend, uh, how are I going to treat each other. And <coughs> say, I was talking yesterday, um, since we have seen a map of how secular and pluralist uh, different countries are, Sweden is always up down in the corner. Uh, so, here, I am the only one out. <laughs> 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 uh, from this secular in this, in this country. And, um, but still there are Christians under current. Christianity is still, and you, the culture, uh, of course, the undercurrent is still Christian. But they are more, I would say, replaced with democracy or nature. So it was still a, how are you going to be a good friend? But instead of co incorporating that into religious teaching, there were democracy. Now we're going to teach about democracy. So democracy is sort of new religion, more or less. Um, they usually used, um, for example, uh, how to be a good friend. They have these four corners. I don't know if you recognize this. Um, you have, if you have a statement, and then the children are going to have four corners and going to the side. So here you have good, bad, maybe, my own option. So if you have, a, for example, a question that how are we going to do if someone is getting bullied? Are you going to tell the teacher, then you go to that corner? Are you going to tell the bullies, you go to that corner? Uh, are you going to just stand by and look? Or do you have not so one suggested to that? The religious education would have a lot of these exercises uh, to have this how to be a good family. Uh, from 2011, it is the education reform that we are now uh, teaching. And that were our shift, um, more religious shift. Um, well, uh, scientific rationalist perspective on religion. Religions are treated as something you can study. And there are different religions and you can compare, for example, in Hinduism you do this, in Buddhism you did this, and then you have so you can you have it uh, same texts uh, texts in Islam and Christianity so you can compare. Uh, and it's knowledge. So the question is well why the universe the universe exists. 
is not addressed. It is, oh, okay, who does this? This is this, 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 and who does this? So you would have that. Uh, but Christian's undercurrents within that is now surfing, surfing, surfing. And it actually is written that the school is based on Christian and humanities core. And this Christian and humanities has been quite debated because in this and in the middle, is it Christian and as two opposites? Is it Christian and humanities as one? Or what does this and stand for? And there's just been quite a have a non-professional school, why is this said based on Christian and humanities values? Why are these better than other religious values? So there is a debate going on. Um, and of course Christianity is still the religion that's going to be taught mostly, but the other religions are facts about religion. Uh, so the better definition is the, well, the non-existential way. Uh, the existential questions are backed off. They are not supposed to ask these questions. Um, but if you just go below the surface, uh, of course Christianity is what the main religion. Uh, in two weeks' time, we will have a celebration of Lucia in the Swedish school. So now it's a very Swedish tradition. It's a, Catholic saint who have been celebrated in a Protestant way. <laughs> uh, and it's also one of the old heathen traditions who were tried to be reformed by the church. Because uh, you have the, when the light turned. And since the, the old Canada will be a better days after the Canada they are using now, there's a story it's the new Canada since it was only uh, in the 18th century. Uh, so then the turn of the year will be around the 13th of December. And then you see it will be back to life. And we have uh, one girl usually, it's been contested now in generations, and both can also be the Sia, uh, coming with light in her hair, and she has all these symbols. She has a red ribbon around her waist because she was sad, uh, and she has the light in her because it was uh, uh, burned at stake, and so on. Then, but then, of course, it, now it's been a child tradition, so it's celebrated in schools. So do you have these little kids standing with their electric sticks and they're trying to sing the songs and looking very <laughs> mom and dad and then you have it, the small uh, people, they are dressed as a gingerbread, they are dressed as a small Santa Claus and so on. Uh, so this can become a shy tradition. And then of course in that, but then as you can see, you have small Muslim shy standing there and singing Holy Night. Because that is a part of that was that is Lucia song. So how non-confessionist is it? Because if you have Holy Night, it's a quite religious song. So of course Christianity is still the base, and there is always a debate that most uh, parents forbid the kids to participate, which I pretty much understand why. But uh, so if you a religious teach you teach religion, and then you have facts and the non-professional list and you don't if you are in I said it numbers that ninety percent of the, the teacher students were saying they were Catholic. I would say it would be the numbers would be the other way around in Sweden. Perhaps ten percent would say they are Protestant. Um, because being religious in Sweden is quite unusual. You would use the agnostic you say I believe in something I don't think in that Say that is the biggest religion in Sweden, agnostic. Uh, but when you came to, of course, you have a Christian tradition, you have a Christian culture. So when you teach religion, you're not a professionalist, but then you come to history class. And then you have the culture values of Christianity. And that's, this is Gustav Vasa. He was a king from 1523. Uh, and for 40 years onwards, and he was the reforma reformator in Sweden. Um, he took the silver from the churches, he uh, knocked down a few rebellions, but it seemed positive. <coughs> it was something good. Because now, and when I've interviewed 11 year olds about history and what is, what is a big event in history, and they all said, well, we become Protestant and everything good. 
Because then they have been taught in history class that this is the founding father, and it was a good thing, and then the Catholic, they had a photography, and that was not good. So, of course, they are still a Christian undercurrent in the teaching. So you could be very, very aware of it when you teach religion, but when then the teacher goes into other class, they, yeah, they have become the culture instead. Um, uh, this evening I'm going home to this. It's frosty and we're supposed to get snow uh, tonight. So thank you for listening. <laughs>
I have no choice but to send my school children to the local school. And I want to do that because I want them to be part of their local community. I think a school is a community. Um, and I think within a school, we should be able to cater for religious people, um, Catholic, Protestant, still like children can be doing online courses in their own faith. But I think there's a huge need to come together um, to address human values. And I suppose my own research showed that non-Catholic students and, um, and showed that post-primary students of a minority faith all wanted um, to be educated together. And I think Daniel Foss found that as well. And um, the children in community schools, when asked, they, want, they don't want to be separated. They want to be educated together. And so to find an Irish solution to to it and coming up to everything. Um, I think where there's a will, there's a way. Um, and I, I, would, I would just strongly, uh, I'd have serious concerns for segregation policy. Yes, Santi. Um, hello, my name is Shanti Cochran. And, um, I found this fascinating because what I'm going to present later this afternoon might put a perspective on it, on children's voices, talking about um, aspects of the issues of diversity and equality. But um, I'm not Irish. I was an educated in Ireland as a, a school girl, but my son was. And so I have this hybrid, if you like, understanding of the different identities that my son had been with it. And so I've come at this uh, you know, um, point as not just a researcher, but also as a parent of a young person. And I feel that Ireland approaches everything around inclusion and integration from the wrong end. We look at it from the inclusion perspective, not the exclusion perspective. If we look at the standpoint of exclusion, then it will inform us greatly about why people are not being included and why we often take the assimilation perspective rather than the integration perspective, whereby you can celebrate diversity. And of course, diversity itself, and this is where I think academics and researchers have something to answer for. This, the word diversity has been taken out of context. It has been used in many ways as a political weapon. It has created more disparity and division in terms of how we think, how we approach, and how we deal with basically the human issue the education of our children. And I think until we start thinking in that way, we will start going down the lines of my home country, the UK, which has used a prevent strategy, which is a terrorism strategy, anti-terrorism strategy, to inform guidance on teacher education, how children should be taught in schools, which I think is creating more divisions in the classroom and in communities than it is creating integration. And the whole point of it was, if we teach them not to become radicalized, we will actually have an integrated community. Actually, what we're teaching is, if you assimilate and make one culture your accepted culture, then you won't be radicalized, and therefore we'll have integration. That is not the way the world works. And I think the reason we go round and round in circles, and I think you said, we keep repeating this, and I've seen this done in the UK and in Australia and other parts of the world, is because we don't start from one standpoint. What is exclusion? What does it mean to people? What do we need to do? Um, thank you. I'm from Northern Ireland, um, but I'm actually quite struck so far by the the, the similarity of a lot of the issues um, about um, the, the, the role of faith formation within religious education, the, 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 the nature of faith schools and so forth. Um, and obviously I'm sharing some, something of, of this a little bit later on. One of the issues that, that the, the way it's often put in Northern Ireland, where of course we do have quite separate systems, uh, traditionally Catholic and Protestant separate systems, state funded systems. What, one of the points that is often made by those defending the, the, the importance of having faith schools and parental choice, which is usually the, the argument that is made, 
is that, uh, and, and I just heard it a few moments ago, that the, the need for children to be grounded in their own religion first. That's very often how it's put. I hear this particularly from the Catholic community, but I also hear it from, from Protestants as well, uh, that children need to know their own religion first. The, the problem with that is that many children do not have that practicing faith. They don't come from families who have a practicing faith. Even, in, and in, certainly in the Protestant side of the community, the culturally Protestant side of the community, and, and even increasingly in the Catholic community. Um, but it, it always strikes me that it's odd that, that we, we don't sort of insist that children are immured from cultural diversity until they know their own background, because you can't live like that, you can't grow up like that. We, we, we live in an in both parts of Ireland, an increasingly diverse society, and that's just a given. So you can't sort of say you've got to learn to be a, a Protestant or ethnically white or, or whatever it may be before you have contact with others. Um, and, and that seems to me to undermine the argument that uh, you know children need you, you need you need to make sure they know what what their own beliefs are. Uh, before they can possibly begin to think about others. It's just, a, it's just an observation that, that strikes me from various things that have been said this morning. Yes, yes. I, I just, um, Kathleen Horgan from Mary Macleod College. I just want to make an observation, and I suppose coming from the perspective of engaging with our students, undergraduates and postgraduate, primary teacher education students, I just feel huge compassion for them because of when you look at the overwhelmingly um, homogeneous backgrounds from which they come mm -hmm. and the schools into which they go and the accommodations and the work that they have to do in order to provide for as best they can the range of diversity within the classes and also given that you know we, we, I heard the word fear and I heard about you know so a lot of, of students are willing to fake it, but many of them can't. It's not an option. But within their, you know, within their class groupings and within the, their peer groups, there is, it's so difficult to challenge your own perspectives and opinions and beliefs when everybody around you is sharing the dominant culture. So the, the, I'm just thinking of these students, recent graduates, current uh, students and future graduates, who are going into this enormously diverse, heterogeneous um, um, in, in environment that is school life and uh, just the level of support that they need uh, in order to provide for those, those children. So it's just, uh, you know, uh, and how can we make it a safer space for them to challenge their own beliefs? How can we be better in, uh, I suppose, interrogating our own cultural backgrounds, our own beliefs, our own assumptions? so that we can actually open up those spaces uh, for student teachers uh, uh, to reflect on some of these issues before they're actually confronted with them. And then they're meeting their prejudices, which they may, may only, only have been implicit face to face. So it's, uh, that's just the, the observation I wanted to make. I think, oh, sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, I might just back up and hear from uh, Luke Institute Technology. My question is more methodological because that's my main interest and I suppose it relates to your research and also the Galway research. I was just wondering, I was struck by the amount of people who skipped the questions. Mm -hmm. And I suppose I'd almost love to have a question at the end on future surveys. Did you skip questions because you couldn't be bothered? Does the topic not interest you? Or were you worried about discovery of who you are and what your answers were? And I suppose that fits with my other thing. I was really the one result that really struck me was the securitization question. Um, that one. Uh, and I wondered, I don't know the, I mean, I looked at the European Value Survey a long, long time ago, and I can't remember many of the questions. But I just wondered, do you feel your own research and the Galway research was there? I often think you need to give people permission to say stuff that isn't, you know, PC. And I wonder how many sort of far right facilitative questions were there in the survey? Uh, and did we perhaps miss um, some of what's in there? I just wonder. 
Can I just say something very quickly and then if you come in. You're absolutely right, Frank, about giving permission. At its rawest, uh, through the readings of our research, we were finding or hearing this same thing that you have to be politically correct and you're not allowed to say what you want. The first time I read that, inside, and this is a lovely point Catherine's made about challenging our own assumptions, I thought, yes, if you're going to be rude and obnoxious, <laughs> you're absolutely right, I don't think you have a right to speak. But of course that's not correct, because obviously we're putting the lid on that which needs to be said, starting at the beginning of this session, the elephant in the room, and this is what we're criticised for. So when I saw the point about the resources in the library at ours being biased, I thought, well, what resources would you expect to find? And then I looked at, the, and when we've written various iterations of our report, um, the far right or the hard right, or where, whatever the correct label is, you know, I, look, I spoke to people on that perspective uh, to say, what books what ideas do you think teachers need to have to adjust this balance? And these are books that initially I wouldn't have uh, given any time of day for because I personally don't want to know. Isn't that interesting, that assumption? I've already decided <laughs> that that's not for me. However, in our writing up of this in, a, in an article for uh, one of the journals, we're trying to find what the gap is. And then the third thing, coming back to yourself, the safe environment, I think that's partly where we're at in our pedagogy, and I know Tush has done a lot of work on belief circles and ways of having activities in a classroom where, as a group, an activity brings out what the group thought, or you find yourself taking out an idea of a piece, and it says, this person believes that immigration is a threat to national security. Now, what do we think about that? So the point's been raised, the person doesn't have to have ownership be excluded and what we've been pushing at and what are the other pedagogies that add to that but the step first Kathleen uh, Catherine is where do we get chance to critique our own prejudice and assumptions before we even give students and do we feel safe because some of the research was saying I'm training as a Catholic teacher in a, in a Catholic ethos Tradition. How can I, therefore, if I'm going to be judged good enough to be a teacher educator primary, how can I say, no, I don't believe in this at all, I'm not compliant, no, I'm just going along with it because this is the job I want professionally? Thank you. Um, Frank, in terms of the skipped, those who skipped, we problematise this. I mean, ultimately, we don't know why they skipped it. We just observed, if we asked them questions that were very easy, or relatively easy to answer, um, they responded to those, and the, the number of skipped was negligible. Um, we wondered, was it survey fatigue, pressure, and may I say that this whole area of religions and beliefs, everybody here knows it's incredibly com complex, contested, challenging for people, um, and binary at times, um, but so we don't know why they skipped it. We can say that we found it very hard to get students to come to our focus groups. And the ones who did come, they were particularly interested in this area. They had a particularly positive experience of the area or a particularly negative experience of the area. But they didn't represent, say, uh, you know, those who might have been quite pragmatic about it or indifferent or nonchalant. They were passionate one way or the other. Um, so ultimately, we don't know. I, I suspect it's a whole variety of things. Um, Kathleen, in terms of the homogeneity of the teaching profession in Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, um, that came out this morning, I'm left with Yoga's question about the politicians and policy and change. I appreciate we have to scaffold and and understand how complex and challenging it is for those students when the world in the classroom is very different to the world in third level for them. But I'm wondering how can we make sure that this homogeneity that we have, relative homogeneity, belief based or ethnic, that how can we change it? 
what can we do? We need to do it urgently. Um, we, it, it's just not sustainable. It's not good for anybody. And um, Mary Masters of the University of Limerick. Um, what I find interesting, I suppose, that question about getting at the truth, that many people, it's unconscious, our belief systems. It's something that we have, um, through a culturization, that through a socialization, where we grew up, our context, that we've assimilated that without much reflection. So I think it would be really interesting for your study, perhaps, after um, uh, participants have read the report to have to interview again and to see just as an opportunity maybe to trigger deeper reflection and maybe more discussion and then maybe a whole new perspectives might emerge which would be you know fascinating to you know, to continue on the study. Mary, you don't know any funding sources <laughs> 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 or open for business. <laughs> I'm Lisa O'Rourke Scott. I teach here in NIT, and I, I was thinking around similar lines to Mary because I'm a social psychologist, and, and I guess my own research was very much about the impact of, of the monolithic Catholic identity on single motherhood in Ireland across mm -hmm. generations. But I was also reflecting on what Norman was saying. Um, there's a social psychologist who you may have come across because he's from up your way, or there was, um, Ed Kerenson. Mm -hmm. And he, he did wonderful work when he looked at whether or not children could tell the difference between Catholics and Protestants up in the counties. He didn't go in and talk to them about that because he didn't want to be that man. But what he did was he showed them pictures that were accepted as recognizably Catholic and Protestant faces. So in terms of acculturation, as young as four, they could do that. They were able, and they rated their own in-group more favorably than the out-group. Um, so they, they don't need to be acculturated in their own uh, religion. They, they, they have that even when they start school. Yeah. It, it's, it's quite stark that that was the thing. White people who look the same to everybody else. <laughs> so it's extraordinary. Yeah. Okay, Billy, do you, do you make this probably the final question at this point? Not to close it down, but that you continue more informally over lunch. Sure. Billy, Billy O'Connor, I'm uh, working in the medical school at the University of Limerick. I'm a neuroscientist by training. Yeah. And just to follow on from what you were saying there, uh, um, babies are born without language, without religion and without culture. All of us were born that way. And then we were imprinted by the language, the culture, belief systems. So each child basically are born as a blank slate. Now they have aptitudes and traits and gifts and so on. So, um, so, so we, when we talk about uh, objective truth, that's imprintable. Um, and there is vested interests, and society has made priorities about uh, this versus a, as a protection mechanism. So uh, now, as we learn more and more about the brain, now more about le the teaching, learning, um, we now are confronted with the concept of truth. What is truth, and what is objective truth, and can that ever be right? So we, we know now that there are a number of discourses in society and the discourse of culture, the discourse of art, the discourse of interpersonal relationships, the discourse of science, and the discourse of um, politics, which probably trumps every reality, and then the discourse of religion and spirituality, which is the personal truth. Now, a, can that be taught to a class um, of children? Um, will it empower them? I think that history is now telling us, as we see with the internet and so on, that that, that that is becoming less effective. People are finding personal truth. Uh, out, there's more opportunities for them to find things that are relevant in their lives than just what the society is giving them on a, a menu card at, in schools. So, so this is happening in a lot of professions, and uh, philosophy is not just a religious teaching. So we're in a revolution at the moment, uh, an information revolution and it's changing the way our children are. They have to adapt to it. So that's just to mention that from a neuroscience perspective. Mm -hmm.
uh, this is a very interesting time now to analyze what the meaning of philosophy is and belief. And uh, just one final point. A, when you take a certain standpoint, people say you have to start from the known and then you go into the unknown. Um, then you tend to get these binary systems. So the opposite of religion is not atheism. Because atheism is another belief system that just doesn't involve a God. The opposite of religion, or the opposite of religious, is irreligious. <laughs> and you find often find more irrelig irreligious behavior between different groups of religious people than you do find in atheists <laughs> or seculars or whatever. So these are the these are the it's all now beginning to be untangled, this knot is beginning to be untangled by this massive amount of information that's coming in from everywhere in the world. And information from science and politics and uh, so, so on and art and all that. So I just mentioned that that uh, the the brain science of learning is really what we're talking about here, and what's to be what is to be given to the child to empower it to be the uh, optimal, the best it can be. Thank you. Okay, that positive so, um, thank you so much for joining us here today and being here today. And um, we did this completely on purpose. And Frank and Lisa, you might want to help me explain this. But it's Christmas today here in LIT. <laughs> and um, it's a very special day. It's the Market Link project um, where, correct me if I'm wrong, but the students, are, they have all produced all of the, um, the things on sale, uh, produced everything there uh, to make money for particular causes, um, for nonprofit organizations. And so it's a wonderful day. It's, it's um, students love it, but everybody loves it. So you're very welcome here. And you're welcome to support it as well. <laughs> We're not getting a cut. <laughs> Yeah, bring your wallet. 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 Yeah